great. All right. All righty. All right, our kiddos are heading down to Idaho and to other places, and uh, good to see you. Oh, and VBS, Justin, you have your T-shirt made back there. That's a one and only masterpiece. If you don't pick it up, we may put it on eBay or something like that and make a million dollars, So, but it's right back there. All right. Oh, where did I put that? All right, two things. Now, wouldn't you leave you without your riddle? I got one left from Father's Day. Let's see if you get this. What do you call a father that's walking on thin ice? Might be me. I don't know. What do you call a father walking on thin ice? Of course, you call him a popsicle. <laughs> All right. Share one uh, prayer request with you, and that is I saw that uh, Franklin Graham shared with the Roe v. Wade decision stuff. Where is that? There we go. Mind that we need to pray several things. One, we need to pray for peace and healing in our country. And uh, a lot of people reacting in all kinds of ways. But uh, pray for that. We need to pray for the state legislatures because that's all that means. Nothing's illegal. It's just gone to the states to make decisions. And we need to pray as they make wise one. And we need to pray for the courage of God's people. Continue to try to live as salt and light in this world. And also, if one of the prayers of many people were that uh, children, unborn babies, would not be lost, uh, we need to more than ever before have compassion and caring for those who have children because uh, that's, we need to have caring and a caring heart. And uh, if we do that, that will solve a lot of the problems that we have in our world. So let's keep that in our prayers and, uh, and let it remind you that uh, God can work in all kinds of ways just when you thought he couldn't. He can, and uh, we need to know that. All right, we are continuing uh, our uh, Spark Studios, and uh, as I shared with you, we've got five lessons in Spark Studios. We've already hit three of them so far. One is that God is a creator. God is a designer. He designed you, created you exactly how you ought to be. And then God, not only is God the creator, designer, but we learned last week Jesus is a king. And we need to let him be the king of our life. And today we're going to learn, number four, uh, that, that Jesus is also the redeemer. He is our redeemer. And then finally we're going to learn about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what? He is our helper. And so let's, uh, let's say together our motto and our scripture together. All right? All ready? Here's the motto. Let's say it together on three. Be enthusiastic like the kids. One, two, three. We are created, designed, and empowered. And going along with our great scripture, which is a scripture, uh, even if you don't get coupons for it, you ought to take to memory because it's a great scripture verse. Not only Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but Ephesians 2, 10. Let's say it together again. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Ephesians 2, 10. And we're going to see today, we're reminded that we're created in Christ. We're recreated. And we're recreated, why? So that we can do good works that will bring honor to God. And God's created us for that. And we need to be involved in that. So as I shared today, we're going to uh, continue looking at those five lessons. And today we're going to look at Jesus, the Redeemer. And... Uh, and we begin that today, we're going to be looking at Jesus' death and his resurrection, which enabled him to be our Redeemer. And the passage we're going to look at today in scriptures is found in Luke chapter 23 and Luke 24. Those two chapters we're going to look at. Luke chapter 23 and 24. And... Uh, and before we begin, I'm going to give you a resurrection quiz. Let me see how well you know these people involved in the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection. Are you ready? If you know the answer, just call it out. These are people. We're looking for people who were eyewitnesses. Jesus told John to watch over me and, uh, and uh, when he was on the cross. Who did Jesus uh, tell John to watch over? Well... 
Mary, that's right. Mary was there at the cross going through the agony of seeing her son die. She was there. John was to take care of her. Secondly, I denied knowing Jesus three times just as Jesus predicted. Who is that? That's right. That is Peter. All right. Third, I helped play Je place Jesus' body in the borrowed tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. Who is he? He also used to have a TV station. Nick at night? No, anyway. Nicodemus, the same one that Jesus talked to in John chapter 3. Nicodemus helped Joseph of Arimathea to get the body of Jesus. Number four, I was the first disciple to arrive at the empty tomb. The first of the 12 disciples, Mary Magdalene. John, that's right. You know why John was the first one there? That's right. He was faster than Peter. Peter was probably older, a little slower. That's right. All right. And number five, Jesus appeared to me as I wept outside the tomb, thinking someone had stolen his body. There you go, Mary Magdalene. That's right. Number six, I doubted that Jesus was alive until I saw him and I felt his scars. Thomas, that's right. Thomas wasn't a bad guy. He just doubted a little. All right, and finally, Jesus cooked breakfast by the Sea of Galilee and told me I was still useful to him for ministry, even though I had denied him. Peter, that's right. That is Peter. That is Peter. All right, all right, y'all pretty smart. All right, we're going to look today as Jesus prepared to go to the cross. We're going to look at his crucifixion and his resurrection today. And as Jesus prepared to go to the cross, he was com in complete control of every event that led to Golgotha. No matter how it looked, Jesus was in control. Jesus came, in fact, to fulfill God's plan to rescue us by providing salvation for everyone who believes. Jesus is a Savior that God promised throughout the Old Testament. And he came to obey the Father's plan to receive the just punishment for our sin so that we might be saved. In fact, there's a great passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, which describes Jesus in this way. It describes him as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. In other words, Jesus, the lamb who died on the cross, was slain from the creation of the world. That meant from the beginning of time, God knew that we would sin. God knew that we would need to be saved. And so from the beginning of time, Jesus agreed to be the sacrificial lamb so that we could have a relationship with God. That is beyond belief. Barclay in his little commentary says, It was to the cross that all scriptures looked forward. From the beginning of time, everything's looking to the cross. The cross was not forced on God. It was not an emergency measure when all else had failed and the scheme of things, when the scheme of things had gone wrong. It was part of the plan of God, for it is the one place on earth where in a moment of time we see the eternal love of God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Now let's look at uh, some of the passages in Luke 23 and 24 today and see our two simple truths, which is Jesus died for us and Jesus rose again. The first thing we'll look at is in Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 13 through 24. And we see that the crowd at least thought that they chose crucifixion for Jesus. In fact, they demanded crucifixion for Jesus. So let's look at 23, verses 13 and 24. It starts out and says, Pilate called the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and I have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Verse 16, he says, Therefore I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. 
Verse 20. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For a third time he spoke to them, Why, what crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with a loud shout, they insisted, insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, in this case, Pilate would have said, I mean, he would have said because the crowd demanded it. And they did demand it. Pilate was not really a righteous man, uh, but he knew right from wrong. Even unrighteous people know that. Three times he declared he was not guilty. In verse 14, verse 20, and verse 22. He came to them three times and said, This man is innocent. He is innocent. And in fact, he said, We even sent him to Herod. We said, You examine him. You find any fault in him. And Herod sent him back and said he wasn't guilty. Pilate knew that it was wrong to crucify an innocent man. But the crowd demanded crucifixion. Verse 21 says they kept shouting, What? Crucify him. Crucify him. The same crowd that had waved palm branches and declared his glory now wanted him dead on the cross. Ultimately, Pilate was what? He was a politician. He had already made some mistakes and had gotten on the bad side of the folks in Palestine and Jerusalem. He had broken some of his customs. And one more bad report to Rome, and he knew that Pilate would be in trouble with Caesar. And Caesar just didn't want any trouble. And if you didn't do a good job and you keep quell the, rebel the rebellion, then you were out of there. And Pilate didn't want to do that. So he gave in to the crowd. Now the crowd may have demanded it, but Jesus willingly went to the cross to complete his saving work. So if you look a little farther in chapter 23, in verses 44 and 49, you'll find the work that he did on the cross. It says it was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun shot stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he said this, and he breathed his last breath. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The crowd thought they had won that day, but it was God's grace that triumphed. You ever hear the words of the song, He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels? I was looking at it this week. Here's the last refrain of the song. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished. He gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. It was done. Several things happened as Jesus died. First of all, there's a great darkness in the land. I don't know whether it was an eclipse of the sun or God just covered the sun with the clouds or God just darkened the sky. I don't know. But it was darkness. And it fell across the whole land. Barclay in his little commentary says the world is dark in a day when man seeks to banish Christ. And I think that's sometimes why our world feels dark, as people seek to banish Christ and his influence and his love from us. It was dark. The second thing, the temple veil was torn in two. This is a huge, thick veil. And it tore not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom. 
Now this was a veil which hid the holy of holies, the place where it was said the very presence of God dwelt, the place where no man might ever enter except the high priest, and he could only do it once a year on the great day of atonement. It was as if the way to God's presence barred to man was thrown open to all. In John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus says, He who has seen me, said Jesus, has seen the Father. When Jesus came, the whole world could see the Father because Jesus was there before us. On the cross, as never before and never again, men saw the love of God. Also, Jesus cried out with a great voice in verse 46 of chapter 23. Three times in the gospel, it tells us of this great cry. That's how it's described. In Matthew 27, 50, in Mark 15, 37, and here in this passage in Luke 23, 46. John doesn't call it a great cry, but he calls it this. In John 19, 30, he says, And Jesus said, It is finished. Now, in the Greek and Aramaic, this phrase, It is finished, is one word, one simple word. It is finished, and the great cry are, in fact, all one. That's the same thing that it's talking about in all the four Gospels. They're one and the same thing. And when Jesus died, how did he die? Not in regret, not in mourning. He died in triumph. He cried from his lips, finished. It's done. God's work of grace is done. And when he cried out, it had an effect on people, didn't it? The centurion, that strong, stone-cold soldier, was at the cross, and he was deeply moved. And in fact, in verse 47, what does it say he did? He says he praised God. I don't know if he's ever praised God, but he praised God on that day because he knew this was a righteous man. Something had happened. He praised God. In fact, I heard someone say that his death did even what his life could not do. It broke the heart of a hard-hearted man. I was looking over in John chapter 12, verse 32. And in John 12, verse 32, Jesus says this. He says, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will do what? Will draw all men to myself. And you know that's true. I've heard many people tell me that when they finally understood the message of the cross when they understood that Jesus died for them, and they understood his sacrifice, that something within their heart broke and was open to God and the love of God. When he was lifted up and he sacrificed it all, men were drawn and have been drawn to him ever since, beginning with the centurion. Christ's atoning death on the cross satisfied the just punishment for our sin and made salvation possible to every person who would receive his forgiveness. Now Jesus discovered on Sunday that he had not died. In their hearts they had lost hope uh, and they went to hide in the end of chapter 23. But when we get to chapter 24, we find the women up at dawn going to the tomb. Now let's take a look at that. In Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Verse 2 says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes and cloths that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Verse 5, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Verse 6, he is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words, verse 9. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other with them, who told them this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed like nonsense. 
Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. What had happened. In verse 5 of chapter 24, the angel asks, Why are you looking for him who is alive among the dead? There's some in our world who regard Jesus as a great man, maybe the greatest man. There are those who think he's a noble hero. And there are those who think he's, uh, who, who live the best life anyone has ever lived. But he just died one day. That will not do. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He's not merely a hero of the past. He is a living reality in the present. Someone said he's not just a model. He is a living presence in our lives. He rose from the grave. But you know, the disciples needed convincing, didn't they? Uh, if you go a little farther in chapter 24, beginning, beginning with verse 36 and, uh, and 49, you know, one of the great things to be true is that even though the disciples doubted, Jesus never gave up on them. Look at verse 36. It says, while they were still, chapter 24, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. He didn't come in condemnation, he came in peace. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your minds? And he says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when, they had, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He says, you are my witnesses of all these things. And I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Jesus patiently explained that he was alive. He would do whatever was necessary. Uh, Thomas said, unless I see his hands and his side, unless I touch him. And then Jesus said, here am I, touch away. Jesus is not afraid to prove himself to us. In verse 42, it says, they gave him a piece of boiled fish. He says, let me have something to eat. You know one of the great things about this, you don't think about much? And that is that the Bible says we'll have resurrection bodies like Jesus. You know what that means? There's a potential for a buffet in heaven. We'll be able to eat. Jesus could eat. He was showing that he was real. In verse 45, he did more than that. He opened their minds so they could understand Scripture. And not only that, he took 40 days. He stuck around for 40 days with them. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes about what happened in those days. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, he says, For what I received I pass on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of all of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me, as one abnormally born. He spent 40 days convincing them, preparing their hearts, helping them to know that he truly was alive. Why? Because verse 47 says, because repentance and forgiveness of sins needs to be preached. The gospel needs to be shared, and you need to be convinced. You need to understand that it's true so that you're ready to get out there and to share the gospel, and to share the gospel. Jesus is a redeemer. He's a redeemer because he died on the cross for our sins, because he rose from the grave. He is the redeemer. The question is, what is salvation? 
What does he redeem us for? What does he save us for? What does he save us for? What is salvation about? Well, salvation is several things. One is salvation is regeneration. It's coming to life. Remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, what did he say? Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, unless you're transformed, something has to happen to you. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, if anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. You've got to come to life, and that's something you can't do on your own. You do that when you turn to God, and God does it for you. And how does it happen? The Bible says it happens through repentance. I remember reading earlier in Easter a verse I just love in Mark 1, 15, where it talks about repent and believe what? Believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. In Acts 2, 38, Peter told the folks at Pentecost, uh, repent for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what does that mean? Repentance is turning away from our sin and our selfishness, doing things our way, and doing what? Turning to God. It's not just getting better, willing it, trying to be a good person somehow. No, it's giving up on your way of life and turning to God and depending upon Him, leaving it all behind and giving your life to Him. That is repentance, turning away from your sin and your selfishness and turning to follow God. Salvation is, is regeneration. It's coming alive for the first time. There are many people we see walking around, and they look like dead people walking. That's because they are. They're dead, spiritually dead. They need to be brought back to life. And salvation can be seen in three ways. One is when you come to God and you repent and you follow Him and you ask Him to save you, you find justification. Justification means you are made right with God. One of my favorite verses is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you come to God, you are made right. You are cleansed. You are justified. You can stand before and with God. Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered up for our trespasses. He went on the cross for our sins and raised for our justification. We can be right with God. We can fellowship with God. Why? Like we've never sinned. We are justified. It is also sanctification. What does that mean? We're not only made right, we're in right standing with God, but we're being transformed for action and service. What is our scripture verse? We're created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared in advance. God changes us and equips us to do the work he wants us to do, to be the kind of people he wants us to be, to have the attitudes, to be able to serve him, to honor him, to share the good news, to live the abundant life, to be transformed to be different, to be created in Christ Jesus. When you come to be a Christian, you're not only made right for God, but you're being made better and better and better so that you're useful to God and so you can enjoy the abundant life. And then finally, salvation is glorification. It's God's promise to see you through the end and take you to heaven. And in John 5, 24 says, when you were saved, you're passed over from death to life. You're promised eternity. And when we get to eternity, we're not going to be sinful. Everything's going to be perfect. We're going to be like Jesus, and we're going to know God's abundance. That's what salvation is. It's making us right, right here and now, working and transforming our lives, and the promise of heaven to come. That's what our Savior brings to us. He is the Redeemer. He is the Redeemer. He saves us and redeems us. You know, a lot of times people asked questions of Jesus, didn't they? They asked all kinds of questions. But Jesus asked questions too. I came across a list of questions that Jesus asked people. Here are a few of them. He said in Matthew 20, verse 32, he says, What do you want me to do for you? He asked people, What do you want? What can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? In Luke 24, 38, he says, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your mind? Jesus said, Why do you question all the time? Why don't you trust me? In Mark 8, 36, he says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet for forfeit his soul? He says, Why are you trading everything in your life for something that's nothing? In Luke 6, 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If I'm Lord, then obey me. In John 21, 16, he asked this question, Do you love me? 
In Luke 22, verse 27, he says, Who is greater, the one seated at the table or the one who serves? He says, Who's greater? Am I greater? Am I not greater than all? And I'm the one who came to serve. Be like me. In Matthew 8, 26, he says, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? God asked us many times, Why are we so afraid? Why are we not trusting him? Matthew 6, 25 says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Isn't there more to life than just stuff? Don't I have more to offer? Matthew 9, 28, he says, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe I can do miracles? Do you trust me? Matthew 9, 4, he says, Why do you enter, entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Why are you messing around with the devil if you belong to me? Matthew 16, 15, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now another question I ask for you today is this. Are you willing to call him Redeemer? Are you willing to call him Redeemer? Do you call him Redeemer? Because ultimately that's the biggest question. Do you call him Redeemer? Are you willing to let him save you? I've told this story before, but I like it. I think it goes along with us, so I'll share it again. And I brought my Boy Scout sash here. I was a Boy Scout and Eagle Scout. And to be an Eagle Scout, you've got to earn 21 merit badges, at least you used to. So I got 21. I didn't get 22, but I got 21 at least. And when you get the merit badges, you have all kinds of things you got to learn. First, you got to be a tenderfoot, second class, first class, star, life, and then you get to be eagle and do a bunch of other stuff. But the merit badges, you have to do a bunch of things. And on there, I've got all kinds of things. I've got, uh, I got uh, wilderness. I've got uh, geology. I've got God and country. You used to have to get that one. I don't know if you do these days. I hope you do. I got nature on here. In fact, some of the ones you're required to earn, one of the ones you might not think about it here, here's a chef hat. I have a cooking merit badge. You know, one of the things in Boy Scouts, you've got to learn how to cook. If you're going to be out in the woods, you've got to learn how to survive and eat off your own food. So we had to learn how to cook. Got camping, there's safety. And I got canoeing, somewhere here is motorboating, there it is, me running over somebody in a boat. There's physical fitness. One of the ones that you had to earn was... You had to earn life-saving, and I've told you about this. You had to learn swimming first and then life-saving. And it was kind of a challenging uh, uh, merit badge to earn. You had to learn life-saving. You had to learn a lot of things. You had to learn some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, facts. In fact, do you know what the philosophy is if somebody's drowning out in the water? What are the three things you need to do? In what order? What are the three things you need to do if someone's drowning in the water? Well, get your phone out and put them on YouTube first. No, that's not it. No, what you need to do is you need to throw, row, or go. You need to throw them something, a life preserver, something that floats. Get them a rope. Throw them something. And then secondly, if, if that's not going to help them, you need to get in a boat and row to them as quick as you can. And then third and only third, do you go to them? Do you swim to them? Why? Because when someone's drowning and you try to save them, you know what they're really good at doing? Drowning you. Even if you're big and strong and all that stuff, they will drown you. And so we had we'd learned ways to save people without doing that, but then we had to learn how to save people. And they had to make sure we were strong swimmers. And, and we did all kinds of drills and stuff. And we had to drop stuff in this lake we were in. Had to swim down to the bottom of the lake and bring up boulders and stuff. And, and uh, that, was, that was the hardest thing for me. But we had to learn how to save people. And the way that you learn how to save somebody is that you don't go come up to them and say, let me save you. No, because they're not going to let you do that. What you do is you have to sneak up on them. You have to swim underneath them, come from behind, and then you grab them over the shoulder hard and grab them as tight as you can, and then you, you swim to shore and kind of lean them over like that. And so they're floating on their back. And if at any point in time you lose control of them, you know what you do? You hit them. You do anything to let them go over you because they will drown you. They will drown you. And so we had to do it, and uh, we had to practice doing that. And so we would practice drowning and, and saving each other, and it was hard. And uh, I've told this story, but we had one guy in our group, and his name was Dan. Dan was about six foot or six foot one or two or something and, and weighed about 100 pounds. I mean, Dan was about as thin as anything. Sharp, sharp, nice kid, but just as thin as anything and strong. Thin and strong. And so 
Every, nobody could save Dan. We dove in and we tried to save Dan. We saved Dan. We saved Dan. And the instructor got mad. He says, y'all just aren't doing it right. He says, everybody out of the water. Dan, you go drown, and I'm going to show you how you save Dan. So he jumped in. He dove, and he went for him once. He couldn't get him. Went for him twice. Couldn't get him. Went for a third time. Couldn't get him. And then he swam over to the dock where he was standing, got up, and looked at Dan in the water and says, you drowned. Drown, drown, drown. He says, Dan is unsavable. Nobody could save Dan. Everybody can be saved unless you don't want to be saved. Are you allowing the Savior to redeem you? Have you allowed him to redeem you? Because it's a choice. That's repentance is. You quit fighting. You trust in him. You repent and you follow him and you allow him to save you and you believe with your heart, and you call him Lord and Savior. Now, one of the hardest things in life is that there are many people out there who don't know they're lost. They don't know they're lost. I remember when I was five years old, we went to a picnic. And uh, where I grew up, when we went to a picnic, we didn't go out to a park, we went to the mountains. And they had places up there with picnic tables, and you're out there in the woods. And I've I grew up camping and hiking, and I grew up going in that when I, from a little kid. And so I remember we were out playing. All the adults were doing adult stuff. We were playing. And, and so I was about five, and, and there's a little boy there who was younger than me, about three. And so he thought I was a great kahuna because I was five. And so he came and followed me around. And so I decided he and I were going to go off on an adventure. And so I told him, follow me, and we're just going to go off and find adventure and, and whatever little kids find. And so we were having a dandy over time. Well, we were gone for an hour, and all of a sudden the adults realized we weren't around, and they got panicked, and they got scared. And they formed a search party and began to comb through the woods, and they didn't find us for a while. And I remember finally one guy tracked us down, and he got us. And he was marching us on back. And you know what I thought in my mind? I thought, what is wrong with you? I'm on an adventure. Leave us alone. All kinds of people out in the world are just like that. They're lost, and they have no idea. They have no idea the sun's about to go down. Everything's going to get dark, and they're in desperate straits. That's why Jesus said, we need to go out and preach the good news. Now, we don't have to stand on some soapbox and yell at people, but we need to do what? We need to tell people that we were lost and now we're found. We need to tell them about what we found in Jesus Christ and that we call him our Lord and Savior and we wouldn't make it without him. Why? Because soon enough, the sun's going to go down and they're going to be in darkness, not just for today, but for eternity. Do you believe what Jesus says? Jesus says, unless you belong to him, you're separated from him for eternity. We need to share the good news. We need to proclaim to everybody, he is a redeemer. He is a redeemer. When anybody gets a good look at that redeemer, you know what they do? Their hearts melt. Because for the first time in their life, they see someone who believes in them, loves them, cares for them, plans for them, has a everything for them, longs for them, longs to join their life and to make it just what they want it to be. What are they looking for? Jesus is the one thing that makes everything complete. Amen. We have got to let everyone know that he's the Redeemer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for all those among us here today that you've redeemed. Whether we're an adult or a young child, you called us out and we said yes. Lord, if there's anyone here today who hasn't said yes, let them choose you today. And for all the rest of us, Lord, let us be just like the disciples and let us go out and share the good news that you have risen and you love them and you have all that life has to offer. Let us share the good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. God's speaking to your heart. You've got somebody you want to pray for today. This is the time to do it. Let's stand together as we sing in our hymn of invitation. The, this evening is uh, 447, Trust and Obey. That's all God asks us to do, but to trust and obey. <laughs> Thank you.
appreciate you playing very much. All right, invite you back tonight at 5 o'clock for Bible study, and uh, our closing chorus is hymn number 448, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. I, I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. Satisfied as long as I walk, let me walk close to thee, just a closer walk with thee. Thank you.